Um, so uh, let me um, start by welcoming everybody uh, to the Transportation Safety uh, Webinar Series, Moving Research into Practice. This uh, webinar series is jointly hosted by the Roadway Safety Institute at the University of Minnesota and the Midwest, Trans uh, Midwest Transportation Center at Iowa State University. Um, and the purpose of these uh, webinars is we're highlighting innovative transportation research. Um, the webinars share the impacts of these research topics that we um, are discussing, and you'll hear from um, the researcher and the pr practitioner that um, is implementing results in the field. Um, a recording of the webinar will be available um, both on the Ra Roadway Safety Institute and the Midwest Transportation Center website. Um, a little uh, Housekeeping, you'll see on the main screen um, the PowerPoint presentation, and to the right of that screen, you'll have an opportunity to um, ask questions or leave comments. Um, and you can do this either throughout the presentation or um, afterwards when we pause for uh, questions. So um, there is a series of polling questions throughout the presentation that I will read as we go along. We'll pause and give you maybe a, a half a minute or so to um, respond to those. Um, and then what we would like to do is um, ask additional um, information from you if you have it, that if you've tried something that we haven't covered in the, um, uh, the presentation today, um, and if you'd be so kind to kind of let us know and give me your email address, um, I can then uh, follow up with you and we can um, kind of discuss what, uh, what's been done uh, either in different states or um, in Iowa. Um, so there is a professional development certificate available today um, upon request. So if you email me, I will um, put my email address in this box and send to everybody um, during the presentation today. Um, so if you shoot me an email and uh, let me know, I'm, I can get that to you. So let's start by um, introducing our speakers today. You'll hear from uh, Mr. Neil Hawkins and Lee Bicky on a topic of evaluation of low-cost traffic calming for rural communities. So I'll introduce our first speaker today. Um, uh, Mr. Neil Hawkins is an Associate Director here at the Institute of Transportation at Iowa State University. He's um, also served as the director of two centers at Intrans, the Center for Transportation Research um, and Education and the Center for Weather Impacts on Mobility and Safety. Uh, Mr. Hawkins has more than 25 years of experience in traffic engineering operations and safety. And he was also an adjunct lecturer at the Iowa State University's Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering. Um, our second speaker today um, is going to discuss a little bit about how this research has been implemented in the field, um, discuss um, maybe how successful it's been, and uh, hopefully kind of interact with um, you guys as participants and see if you've got any questions and, and uh, challenges for us. Um, I'll give you a little bit um, of background um, on Mr. Beerke. Um, he has served as a county engineer at Winnesheet County in Iowa since 2000. He has also served as an interim county engineer in Fayette County and Howard County in Iowa. And he is a licensed engineer um, in Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. And he's a graduate of the University of Wisconsin. So now, without further ado, I will turn you over to Neil. Thank you, Teresa. And it's a real pleasure to be able to visit uh, and share uh, some of the research we've conducted here at uh, Iowa State University uh, in partnership with lots of other uh, organizations. And so um, I commute every day uh, about uh, 25 miles and uh, as perhaps many of you do as well and on my journey from uh, the small community I live to the larger community I go through uh, two or three uh, small towns. And so uh, similar to to that, you you might as well. And and oftentimes, uh, what happens is that uh, we're on a nice two lane rural road. There's absolutely nothing but uh, deer and raccoons and corn and beans on each side of us. 
and we're doing, you know, it's posted 55 miles an hour, and oftentimes we're doing a little less than 60. Uh, the problem is when we come into these small communities, which may or may not require you to stop, um, but they typically have a slower speed zone. Getting people to slow down in the advanced area of the community and within the community is difficult. It's hard. I admit it. It's hard to slow down to 25 miles an hour when you're in a small town. There's not a lot of schools or built up things around the roadway. And so this is kind of a perpetual problem. And so we started doing some research on this uh, uh, probably more, 10 years back. And it's continued to progress, and we've been fortunate to get to try a lot of stuff. Uh, and, and that's what we're going to talk with you about today is some of the things we've tried and measured and seen what the impact it was on speed and be able to present that to you uh, in a conversation and, and ask you some questions so the audience will be able to see how each of you respond uh, to those questions. And hopefully you'll leave with with a good perspective of some of the things that have worked and what hasn't worked, uh, as well as uh, what situation everybody else is in and some resources on uh, where to look up the, this information. So I've given a little bit of the framework of the problem we face in rural rural communities. And uh, you know, just starting with this first slide, they're oftentimes on a state highway or a major commuter county roadway. And so there is some commuter uh, activity that happens through these small towns on our way to where we work or where we live. Um, and in contrast to that, a lot of times that, that one roadway through the town is also their main street, right? It's got sidewalks. It's, uh, it's where kids are playing in the evening, uh, not in the street, but along the street. Um, and we're really battling this idea of folks I'm just trying to get through the town and I'm really, you know, trying to get to where I'm going and I don't, you know, we don't want to slow down uh, enough or to the speed limit, uh, comply with the speed limit in these smaller towns. Compounding that is oftentimes there's a lack of sidewalks or inconsistency on the sidewalks. Uh, some communities will do uh, school zones along these roads uh, and uh, because they don't have uh, engineering staff or, or aren't, uh, aren't equipped to go out and change the uh, speed enforcement signs uh, seasonally. You know, you might have an entire summer that you drive through this town and it still says 25 miles per hour uh, beyond through the school zone. And so there's a number of things that kind of lead to this lack of compliance and uh, issues with speed management. Uh, and so these things really do affect the quality of life in the community. You don't want a bunch of motors speeding through two times a day uh, through your town, uh, especially all year long where, um, you know, you have a community, you have people walking around, walking back and forth, and, and this just degrades the quality of life for that town, as well as Im impairs safety. Go ahead. So some of the challenges that we face in our rural communities are, uh, you know, just the fact that uh, about almost a third of the fatalities are typically speed related. Uh, but when you're in a rural area, uh, you're, you're now away from emergency medical services. There's oftentimes a requirement of these small communities to use volunteer staff for their EMS. Uh, they may be shared among multiple communities. And so you're up to one or two times uh, uh, an incre you're looking at one to two times increase in response time uh, for emergency medical staff to get there. Two to three times higher fatality rates in urban areas, uh, rates in rural versus urban areas. And unfortunately, pedestrians are about twice as likely to be killed in a rural area than they are in an urban area. Again, that's compounded by uh, lack of access for EMS services, longer times to get you to a hospital, and, uh, to, you know, oftentimes narrower road, lack of shoulder, lack of bike paths, uh, and things like that. And so it's a combination of factors that, that, that add to these statistics, but these are the facts. And this is why addressing speed management, specifically within the small communities, is something uh, that has had a, a, an interest and a focus on. 
Some of the other uh, unique conditions that exist in our small communities is uh, that we, you know, we host a variety of vehicle types and user types of these roadways. Yes, it's the road that connects to, to across the county. It's also the road that connects within the community. And it's oftentimes the only good route through a community. And so you get everyone using it from golf carts up to combines. And so that's something we have to think about when we're trying to do speed management techniques and treatments. Uh, you can't always use what you're using in an urban area. The smaller community oftentimes does not have staff who can attend a webinar like this. They, you know, it's not that they can't attend it, it's they don't have anyone. All they have is a public works director. They may not even have that. They may share resources among an entire uh, in three or four communities. And so, uh, getting this kind of information out is, is, is important um, and, and helping people make decisions about these uh, treatments that will help uh, manage safety within their town specific to speed is critical. Um, these main roads, as I mentioned before, often serve as a uh, you know, place for your bikes and walking and, and for pedestrians and your school is along that. And uh, as I said, there's a, a real variety of driver mix, which would be older and younger, uh, commuter, non-commuter, uh, as well as uh, freight, um, you know, getting grain to and from, getting um, agricultural goods through and, and across the county into co-ops. Uh, and then, um, you know, we all have different driver expectations. And so, um, that's, uh, that's also something we have to think about as we start putting devices and treatments in these communities. So what is it we're trying to do and what are we going to talk about? We're really focused at reducing speed as you enter the community. You know, you've been out driving in the county uh, for five miles. It's just wide open space. And now you're going to go through a small town and then right back out into the county. This is that transition area where we're trying to get you to slow down. We're trying to get you to comply with the local speed limit. They're not always set appropriately, and so that's always an issue too. You know, some communities go three, four miles out of town and start reducing your speed, or they just wait until you're right at the edge of the town and they go straight to 25. And so uh, these are, you know, setting these transition zones, reminding drivers that you're within a community uh, and how you do that is important, uh, and maintaining that reduced speed within the community is also critical. Uh, oftentimes they do a good job maybe scaring you right up front, but then your speed creeps back up as you're starting to head out of town and back out into the county. This photo is an example. Uh, entering into a small community, they're bringing you right down to 25 miles an hour right away. And so with that, we're going to uh, we're going to uh, sprinkle some questions in and amongst this uh, presentation to uh, to get a sense of, of your experiences, and uh, Teresa's going to assist me. She's going to read each of the questions, and then you'll be able to see the results here uh, live. Okay, so um, I'm sure most of you can see the questions here and read them yourself, but I'll just go ahead and read it. Um, we're trying to capture as much of this information as possible. So what is the most significant safety problem in your small rural community? A, speeding within a transitional zone. B, speeding within a rural community itself, speeding at specific locations, speed in all locations, or not applicable. So hopefully we gave you enough time to catch it. Um, we can change the um, time limit on that if you'd like to. Um, just give us a comment there. And we did get a comment here a second ago on somebody asked if the slides will be available after the presentation, and they would definitely be available on our um, both of our websites. So um, <clears throat> they will be available if you uh, want to um, download something like that um, after the presentation. So, okay, so we got some of your um, answers there. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll um, capture any questions you've got to. So let's see what we've got. Not answer. Maybe we given, didn't give everybody enough um, time on that. So we might want to adjust the time limit to 45 seconds or something. Um, but so we've got speeding in all locations is kind of the um, dominant answer in that one. So, okay, that was your your chance to uh, that was your uh, shot across the bow and getting woke up, everybody. <laughs> and that's what we need a much higher participation rate, yeah. and it's coming up pretty quick. So, yeah. so be ready. 
Uh, so here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about these different countermeasures we've used, all in small communities. And uh, you, what you see here is a list of them. There's pavement marking, treatment types, traffic control devices, signing in the gateway area, well, welcome to, uh, horizontal uh, physical displacement. We're literally moving you uh, horizontally out of your lane, moving you over a little bit, getting you to reduce speed through that. Vertical displacement uh, would be where you're putting a, a change. Uh, it could be anything from a speed hump, speed bump, uh, or some other treatments we'll show you. And then, of course, enforcement is something that's always a strategy, but it's not very easy to do in smaller communities. Uh, there's usually uh, an issue with resources and uh, it's just something that uh, there may not be a dedicated staff to uh, to help address. So consistency uh, is it can also be a problem. And so with that, we're going to do another quick poll. So everybody get ready. <laughs> All right, we'll give you 45 seconds for this one. Uh, there's going to be a test at the end to be ready. Um, so what to, to what extent have you tried speed management in the smaller rural communities um, or within the transition? Not used at all, has been tested but not widely used, or maybe limited use. So we'll give you a few seconds to answer that. Um, and you know, if you haven't experienced any of this, this is fun. We'll really we'll after your comments as well on this. So we're trying to capture as much as we can so we can move forward successfully with our research. So we'll give you a few more seconds, and uh, hopefully we'll see that you all participate at this time. Calculating. Yeah. Well, I can start. Uh, oh, there you go. Let's widen that out. So, first of all, great job. Good participation. Uh, what's it look like, Therese? Uh, uh, most is a limit. Yeah. yeah. So maybe some people have tried uh, one or two things, but uh, uh, certainly not the majority. Uh, and a variety of, of mix of answers here. So, so why don't we talk a little bit about some of these treatments and, and um, what we've tried and what it has and hasn't worked. And we're going to start with uh, pavement markings. Uh, one reason pavement markings are uh, uh, commonly used is, you know, at most of the roads we're talking about all will have uh, pavement markings on them. They'll have for sure a center line uh, pavement marking and oftentimes a white edge line unless you have curbing uh, within the community itself. But they're low cost. Uh, you typically are painting through your community uh, every year or every other year, uh, these lines specifically. It certainly uh, provides guidance to the motors, reinforces the message, uh, and is within the driver's line of sight. These are normal types of things we encounter as drivers. Um, and what we're doing is, is tweaking that a little bit to, to, to use messages and things to help get their attention uh, as they come into a, a community. So with that, um, one of the things we've tried is narrowing the lane uh, through use of pavement markings. Uh, when we do that, it, it's basically taking an existing lane width, let's say 12 feet, uh, or let's say uh, in the case of the bottom photo, you've probably got about an 18-foot lane, and uh, using white pavement marking to, to cross out that, that extra area and, and narrow up the lane to more of a normal lane to prevent speeding through this, uh, through this town uh, and in this community. In the photo on the top, we've, we've gone in and created a center island, uh, whereas before it was just a wide, uh, probably almost a three-lane uh, wide road striped as two-lane. And uh, again, it, it, the attempt here is to uh, more formalize the lane where you should be and provide some sense of uh, you know, managing your speed within your lane in a little bit narrower lane than, than something wide open. 
Uh, and so uh, you can see there's some little push pins in a, in a box. The cost of doing uh, pavement markings is relatively inexpensive. It's just the cost of the installation. The paint is not that much of a cost, so it's really the crew time. Uh, but unfortunately, what we found in, in, the, in the sites that we looked at is that it just was real mixed. Some sites had a little bit of an increase uh, in speeds. Others heights had a small decrease in speed. We're talking one to two miles per hour. We really didn't have enough sites to, uh, to get a sense uh, of the effectiveness of this other than to say for those sites we did test, uh, we, we felt that uh, it didn't have much impact on either the mean speed, the 85th percentile speed, or uh, on those motorists traveling 10 miles over the posted speed limit. So if it's 25, you know, for those folks traveling 35 and above, did it have an impact? No. And so that's why those push pins uh, in that little box are red. Really didn't find a lot of impact. We also then looked at adding uh, messages. You'll see these on occasion as you drive around. Uh, things like 25 miles per hour or stop ahead or pedestrian crossing. And so we added those to a number of locations. Um, we wanted to make sure that the messages we were using corresponded and supplemented the existing signage. This isn't something unique that is not also put on a sign. It's something that supplements the existing signage. But it's reinforcing to the driver, hey, you know, you're in a 25 mile per hour area. Uh, you need to maintain that speed. So we tried that in a couple of communities. And again, it's low cost. Uh, you know, take a template and, and, and install it was the real cost. Um, so low cost, but again, it had very little impact on speeds uh, throughout those areas we measured. In the bottom of the slide, you'll see we had a couple of sites with a moderate decrease in speed, but we had a moderate increase in another two. We had two sites that decreased by two miles an hour, so that's cool uh, in terms of in the world of reducing speed and speed management. But uh, then we had two sites that had no change. So, you know, mixed results. Uh, we're not talking about 100 sites we've tested here. We, we, we did not have that many to do, but uh, we just felt that uh, from the data that it wasn't having a big impact. And similarly for those vehicles traveling, uh, the percent of vehicles traveling 10 miles over the speed limit. The, uh, we also did more of a targeted on pavement message for the, the word slow and found similar results. There's also uh, a school of thought where people want to put something that, that changes the perception of the uh, motorist. And on the left is sort of a 3D looking speed table that is tried uh, to get people to think they're going to hit something that kind of sticks up out of the pavement, uh, but it's really done by paint. And, you know, hats off to some of the creative artists who can draw things on pavement that looks 3D. It, you see things all the time and it's really cool. Um, but we're, we're not real sure that has a, a real application in, uh, in the world, you know, in small communities. Uh, we'll show you a few things we've tried to do to um, change the driver's perception of how fast they're going. But things that are, um, you know, these illusions and some things like that, we're, we're not sure. The last thing we want is for a motorcyclist or someone to slam on their brakes and, you know, go flying when they see something that looks like a brick in the side of, you know, in the road or this 3D speed table. And so we just wanted to show this to you. There's, there's some, some uh, things, some literature out there and some things that have tried. We haven't tried any of these odd looking um, treatments, but uh, have done a few things for perception. And this is one of them. This is what we call a transverse uh, or optical speed bars, uh, speed markings. And so what you're seeing in the top photo is just sort of a two foot uh, by one foot speed bars painted within the lane. Uh, the driver would be coming at you in the photo there uh, where we painted it. We're doing that at the entrance to the community. We're trying to provide some sense of lane narrowing. Uh, hey, you're entering, you know, you're not in the county anymore. You're actually entering town. You're entering an area that's special. It's a community. It's going to have, you know, although you still got no sidewalk yet, um, 
you're going to uh, very soon. And so it's really to be placed in advance of where you want them to start slowing down. We used both uh, paint and thermoplastic. The paint, of course, did not last as well, uh, given that we plow snow uh, here in Iowa. <clears throat> but uh, the thermoplastic did have a much better uh, life. Um, what did we, oh, I should say the, the bottom photograph is a similar idea, but it's actually using three of these bars where your, your tire tracks would go in the gap in between. And again, it's, it's, uh, it's letting you know you're in a new uh, area that we're asking you to slow down and uh, we're trying to kind of narrow the lane up and give you that path to keep your vehicle within. We really found moderate decreases in speed. You can see about one mile per hour. Uh, the cost, again, is very low. The 85th percentile uh, was decreased one to two miles per hour, so we're going to say that's moderate, but, you know, nothing to write home about. However, uh, as we look at those vehicles driving 10 miles over the speed limit or 15 miles over, we can see that uh, for the case of 15, we did find, you know, a 4 to 12 percent decrease in the fraction of vehicles uh, driving 15 miles over. So for those high-end speeders, it is getting some attention and getting them to recognize, hey, I better, something's weird here, I better start slowing down, uh, you know, for fear of a ticket. And uh, it'd be hard to say, did you notice all this stuff along with the sign that's there? Another thing we tried, which, um, you probably won't see very often is this uh, idea of converging chevrons. The top photo shows it as you would be approaching this community, uh, and we tried this in a couple of locations. And then the other is an aerial view uh, in another location where uh, you would approach the, uh, the community from the bottom of the page towards the middle of the page in that aerial photo. So as you approach the community, the chevrons go from a very large size down to a, a thinner size and um, a little different gap uh, in between. They get a little bit closer together. So it's, uh, it gives us, the idea was that it gives this impression that, you know, you're, you're, you're needing to slow down, you're approaching the community, you're approaching the point where the speed goes down to 25 miles per hour and uh, sort of like a landing strip, it's, it's getting narrower and smaller as you get closer. And the idea would be that it gives this driver a perception uh, that they need to slow down and that they're actually going faster than they are. So that's the idea behind it. Uh, we tested it in two communities, uh, both at the gateway or entrance to the community. Fairly low cost, just the cost of getting these templates and, and, and putting them out there. We actually used one template that we adjusted. Uh, but very little impact on mean speed, about a mile per hour. 85th percent was better, one to four miles per hour, and that was measured um, both at one month after installation and 12 months after installation. But we did find a big impact on those higher end speeders. So uh, the fraction of vehicles uh, traveling 10 miles over that posted speed was reduced by 16 to 59%, so almost 60% in one case. That's impressive. You're really knocking that high-end speed down. And then for those vehicles driving greater than 15 miles per hour, it ranged from 16 to 92% decrease in that fraction of vehicles driving greater than 15 miles an hour. So we were very pleased that it knocked in some of the high-end speeders. Um, from a practical standpoint, I will share with you that these are a real pain in the neck to install. Uh, and so uh, that's something to think about as well. This idea of colored entrance treatments, if you, uh, if you watch the Tour de France or if you look at Google Photos, aerial images of, of places over in Europe, you'll see the, the gateway areas uh, for a community, small community, are, are some of these treatments, you know, they'll paint red or green across both lanes. Uh, one other thing to note, look at the width of the lanes here in these two photos. Uh, they're extremely narrow lanes. So they're commonly used in Europe. We did a modification of these, uh, and we tried it in the transition zones, and, and that's what I'll show you on the next slide. So we did this colored entrance treatment. We, uh, we used about a 12-foot uh, width um, big template 
we put uh, we we initially did this with paint. It did not last. We did it the next time around with thermoplastic, which worked very well. Uh, we tried it at six locations, uh, three different communities. And as you can see here, we as you approach the community, you'd see 35 mph. Um, we the, they were relatively low cost. We actually worked with the Iowa DOT in, in this case as part of our research, but you know it's it's really the the template. Uh, and, and uh, the paint. The thermoplastic, of course, is a little bit more expensive, um, but you get a lot more in durability. Uh, we found that for the mean speed, it was, you know, between one and four miles per hour. The 85th percent was up, you know, up to two mile per hour decrease in, I'm sorry, two to five mile per hour decrease in speed, which is pretty impressive. Uh, and then for those high end speeders, greater than 10, up to 74% decrease, and for greater than 15, we had a range, but from zero to every vehicle, 15 mile per hour and over, had reduced their speed. So we gave that a green pin for those vehicles greater than 10 miles an hour, and a yellow for the mean and 85th. But it it it, it has been effective from our perspective and from what we measured. We've also tried and seen some things over again in Europe, this gateway treatment. They call it dragon's teeth. Uh, you can see the the triangles on the side. It's similar to those uh, those bars, those transverse bars uh, I showed you, but this is using kind of a, you know, a point to it. Um, this thing to click here. So we, we tried these in combination with a colored entrance treatment. Uh, and so we added these dragon's teeth to a community uh, we felt that it did, again, have the moderate decrease in speed, but for those going 10 miles and over, it had uh, an impressive reduction in the fraction of vehicles going 10 miles per hour and over. Again, it's a little bit harder to measure when it's in combination with the, yeah, the uh, red uh, treatment that you see, the 25 MPH. So we can't say here, oh, it was just the dragon's teeth or it was just the red. Uh, and we didn't do enough to isolate those between each other. But you can see what it looks like. Again, it's just trying to say, hey, you're not in the country anymore. you got to slow down. This is our community. So with that, that leads us to a quick question. Okay. So um, like we said before, we're trying to capture as much as we can from you guys. And let's all try and participate this time. Um, so the question is, have you tried any of the following for speed management in rural communities? Okay. All that apply in this one. Um, so the lane narrowing using pavement markings or physical narrowing, um, on pavement signing, speed limit slow, different things like that. Um, perceptual markings like optical speed bars, uh, bars um, convergence chevrons, colored entrance treatments, or perhaps maybe none of the above. So let's um, uh, try and answer if we can. We've got a few more seconds left, um, and uh, we'll see what you guys have to um, offer. Um, with results to that. So it takes a little bit of a uh, couple of seconds there to generate these. All right, now the results this time. None of the above was a common on, on pavement signings, lane narrowing. Okay, so about a yeah. third of you, none of the above. Um, about 16% were on pavement signing, and about 15% were lane narrowing. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so next up, uh, we we wanted to just address the, the issue of, of adding signs and signing, um, whether it's regulatory or warning. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about dynamic speed feedback signs, uh, community entrance markers, um, and, and really for the community entrance markers. As you drive around, small communities uh, have a real sense of pride, and a lot of times you'll see a unique entrance feature that is basically telling you this is our community, this is when we were founded, and whatever unique kind of thing about the town. These are great. And um, we have this sense that those help the drivers, especially those, well, let's just say all drivers, you know, have some feeling that, wow, I'm actually within the community, I need to slow down, it's getting my attention that I'm in this uh, community. 
Unfortunately, we don't have anything that measures the effectiveness of those, but we think they, have, they contribute to that sense of space and that transition from uh, country to uh, small community. So we're going to talk for a minute about dynamic speed feedback signs. We tested four different types uh, within rural communities. We've also tested them on uh, rural curves. Uh, these are tip almost, I think, exclusively all, all tested on two-lane uh, rural roads. And uh, we've the variety uh, that we've tested uh, go from the one on the top, which is uh, giving you a message. Uh, it also then would display your speed. So it's both, uh, you know, alphanumeric. It's, it's giving you both, and it can flash back and forth. The one in the bottom is, is the same. It'll give you your speed. It will also ask you to slow down, and uh, it will flash uh, until you uh, comply and slow down. Oops, wrong button. And then two, two others. Uh, one is just a simple display of your speed. And then the, the one on the right is simply a 25 mile per hour sign with LED lights around it. For the first two that I showed that, that both tell you your speed and tell you a message, we found that those impact and, and have a big uh, influence on uh, speed as well as drive, uh, vehicle, the percent of vehicles driving 10 miles over the speed limit. I'm not sure why that didn't get copied into the uh, to the slides, so we'll provide that for you as you download the slides. Um, these two on the back, again, the one on the left, which uh, provide your speed, did did as well have a, a you know more than five mile impact on that. The the 25 mile per hour sign with the LEDs around it, not as much. Um, it did you know probably less than five mile per hour impact. And quite frankly, in uh, in the with with how it's oriented, sometimes in the afternoon, if the sun's right on it, it's hard to see those LED. So in in a evening, dusk, and dawn, they show up very well. In high noon, high sun, uh, not as well if if you're uh, driving into the sun or if the sun's hitting the sun. One thing I wanted to say. So I'd like to say for sure, uh, these types of signs are effective. And that's been proven uh, in a number of different uh, research efforts. But they're expensive. And oftentimes, these signs can be, uh, especially the, the two on the front, you know, they can be five to, to eight to $10,000 installed. And this is really the prohibitive issue for small communities. Number one, they don't have $7,000 to put one of these in. Uh, number two, they don't have anyone to maintain the thing. So if it starts telling people you're doing, you know, 55 and they're only doing 25, you know, it's out of calibration, something's wrong with the radar that's inside the sign, uh, it's aimed off into the sky or, or it's been tinkered with, um, it's a problem because they, they really don't know who to call. They don't know, they don't have someone on board to, uh, to go and fix and calibrate the sign. However, the places that they have worked, they work very well. I drive past one every day, and I literally gauge my speed uh, based on that, and uh, I see other drivers hitting their brakes as well. So expensive, but effective. With that, Teresa, I think you're back. All right. Um, okay, so question four. Um, enforcement is not a traffic engineering measure, but how extensively have you used enforcement for speed management in small rural communities? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, do you use them periodically for troubled locations? Use regularly within transitional zones? Use regularly within communities? Have regular patrol with larger jurisdictions, for instance, officers patrol communities within county, or are not widely used at all? So, we'll give you a few more uh, seconds there to answer that, and then I'll uh, generate your answers here for us in a second. That would be really interesting to hear what you guys have to say. We're just 
Alright, let's see what our results say. Looks like about 25% used periodically for troubled locations. Yeah. Uh, much less for the other B, C, and D. And about 15% do not widely use. Okay, interesting. So we're going to talk uh, about some, uh, a little bit about displacement. Um, one thing we've tried and seen is this idea of putting a, an, an island or a median or, or moving uh, traffic over as you approach a community to go from just that typical two-lane rural road into dividing you up against the opposite direction of travel. Um, the literature says it encourages a speed reduction because you've changed their alignment. You've made them uh, drive a little bit off the straight path. Uh, these can be done in a temporary or permanent fashion. Uh, the only issue there is for rural communities, you know, are you still going to be able to get those the farm equipment uh, through there? Do you have larger trucks that need to be accommodated as like grain trucks and things as they go through your, your town? Um, and winter maintenance can be an issue uh, if if uh, if this is something in the middle of the road that needs to be cleaned or maintained so people know what's there in the winter. Um, things used are road narrowing, so they actually narrow the lanes, bring the curb in or uh, use paint, um, change the road from a, a four-lane to a three-lane road, road diet type of thing, or, or change chicanes, which actually kind of shift the traffic over to the right and then back to the left. Um, we didn't, we're not reporting on specific things we did here because we were focused on low cost issues uh, that communities could afford. Uh, so you'll see there's uh, more than one dollar sign next to these. The literature showed that you get about a five mile per hour, up to a five mile per hour reduction uh, for either the road diet reducing uh, lane widths or this chicane where you kind of get people uh, moved over to the right. But uh, again, these are a little bit more expensive options. They require doing something out in the middle of the road, and um, it's not something that we were trying, given our requirements to stay at a low cost. So, Teresa, I think this is the last question okay. within the slide set. See, let's let's challenge them and see how many we can get. Right. Let's see if we let's so the uh, the participation is slowly creeping up there. So I think we're at about forty five percent now. <laughs> so let's go for one hundred percent this time. When considering treatments, what is the most important consideration besides cost and effectiveness? So is it accommodation of specific vehicles, um, like vehicles, large trucks, um, agricultural equipment, different things like that? Um, consideration of design drivers, so older drivers, um, you know, maybe not familiar with uh, new pavement types and different things like that. Roadway characteristic, uh, characteristics, pavement types, cross sections, um, or other. Um, and, and then, put a note, if you wouldn't mind, if uh, you select other, put a note in the comment box um, and tell us about uh, what you've experienced in your community. So we'll take a couple of seconds to generate those answers for you. Oh, we went down on participation that time. <laughs> um, so it looks like accommodation of specific vehicle types yeah. is, is the most uh, dominant, about 25%, followed by roadway characteristics. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So one of the other uh, types of things uh, that has been tried is putting something vertically in the road, um, which would uh, have the, you know, again, displace the driver, make them think about where they're at in their lane, make them reduce their speed. Uh, some of the things that you, again, as the poll just suggested, is the vehicle types. You've got to make sure you've got consideration for those. What is the speed of the roadway you're actually talking about, uh, where you're going to put something vertically in the road? Uh, and some of the typical measures are landscaping um, uh, or other physical devices. And so this is a treatment that uh, that was a part of the route I took to and from work, and I really like this treatment. It's using these tubular markers. Uh, it's it's on each side of a centerline uh, centerline pavement marking, 
Um, this section of the small community actually had curbs, and uh, so there was no uh, edge line. It's just a curbed roadway. And uh, these really created a sense of uh, the need to slow down as you entered this community. These are all foldable, so as you hit them, they bend over. And we had a 25 mile per hour uh, speed sign, wind sign, on in the very middle as you, uh, at the, let's say, head of this island. So we called them channelizer posts. We created an island out of them. And we thought they did uh, an admirable job of giving you that sense of, I'm not in the county any longer. Uh, the only hiccup was uh, we visited with the community and everybody was on board. They really liked them. We worked out a few uh, driveway issues, things like that. Um, but unfortunately, their snow plow operation was not done by the city. It was done by the county. And the snowplow blade was um, of a width that it had a real hard time staying out of these as they plowed this road in the middle of the winter. And of course, the very first time they thought about it and, and dealt with it is when the plow driver, you know, at about 11 p.m. was going through here plowing this part of the road and they took out a whole host of those. So the following year, we removed them uh, during the winter months and that worked much better. But that was an issue uh, in terms of uh, keeping these out there and on the road. Uh, in terms of mean speed, we found you know up to about three mile hour reduction, and that somewhat held uh, after the up to the first year. The 85th percentile speed similar initially, you know about a three mile reduction, but only about a mile after 12 months. Um, but those vehicles driving greater than 10 miles over the posted speed limit, we saw up to about a 50 percent de decrease. Uh, in the percent of those vehicles after one month uh, of installation. And then that held to about a third of all drivers uh, still decreased in, in that uh, driving 10 miles an hour over uh, at one year. And so there was a sustained effectiveness for that high-end speeding group. Uh, and then for uh, greater than 15 miles per over, the percent of drivers doing that decreased by 50% and again about 25% after one year. So. For those high-end speeders, this really got their attention and it got them slowed down. And that's really the, the target group you're trying to get slowed down. That's who's going to surprise a kid on a bicycle, someone walking along the street where there, in this case, no sidewalks. And so it, it was a it was an effective treatment uh, in our perspective. But again, maintenance is an issue that has to be uh, dealt with, as well as large large ag vehicles, uh, which uh, we had more than more than a few come through, and they. They they uh, they simply would drive and it would bend down and then they would pop back up. We did a similar combination of that, but not quite as wide. We didn't create the island. We bought these uh, channelizing pieces that you put right on center line, as you see in the picture. Uh, we're putting those down, and then the the wind sign type uh, object marker was placed on top of that. Um, and again, we had moderate decreases in speed, but we had uh, impressive decreases in the percent of vehicles driving both 10 and 15 miles per hour over the posted speed limit. So uh, these worked very well again, but uh, we took them out in the winter having learned from our previous project. Okay, we also tried to speed table within the community. A lot of what I've been talking about is uh, in the transition zones. Uh, within one, one community, we installed a uh, speed hump. We installed it to be removed. It was on a uh, membrane, so it could have been removed if the city wanted to, uh, but they liked it. They kept it in place. Uh, we saw uh, up to four mile per hour decrease in speeds for both the mean and 85th percentile speeds and a huge decrease, a removal or almost a, 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 re, a complete um, absence of vehicles driving 10 and 15 mile per hour over uh, because, you know, everything in their trunk would end up at the roof of their trunk and all their groceries are in the front seat with them. So you can see the cost is expensive. These are 7000 or so dollars to get done with, uh, this was with asphalt. Uh, but they do have a huge impact. And again, you have to be considerate of where it's at within the community and if it would work for, for your, your community. Okay, Teresa, I think this is the last question. All right, last question for you guys. 
Um, so we want to know, have you tried any of the following for speed management in rural communities that you're involved with? Um, either static sign-in, gateway signing, dynamic speed feedback signs, flashing beacons, landscaping, vertical treatment, speed hunt, speed tables, or none of the above. Um, or if you've got comments on, on other treatments that you may have um, uh, used that we hadn't mentioned here, please let us know and uh, we'd like to learn more about that. So. I talk about the next slide while the poll is yeah. coming in. So recommendations for speed management. Uh, you got to get community buy-in, obviously. You got to think about those design vehicles. Uh, maintenance is a big issue, and so think about how you are going to maintain those uh, devices, and it's something you need to think about during winter months uh, as well. Um, the need for pavement markings, you know, consider durable markings so you're not repainting those uh, uh, or that they last all year long. Um, go ahead, Teresa. And um, make sure that what you put out there is MUDCD compliant, where we use something that was a little bit different. We got uh, approval to use those devices. So just make sure whatever you're trying is MUDCD compliant. Um, and think about, should you know, is it appropriate for the transition zone, uh, or is it something you want to use within the community itself? And so it looks like we've got the results back uh, from the poll, which was, have you tried any of the following speed management um, strategies? Looks like up to 41% had tried the static signage, uh, which is probably most common. 37% uh, tried dynamic speed feedback signs. 29% tried flashing beacons. And another 16% tried uh, speed hump. So that's impressive. And thanks for, the, thanks for your answers. Uh, we've listed some resources here. And I'm just going to, you know, those will be available on the slides. Um, Teresa, I think we should get to the next presentation. Yeah, let's um, introduce Lee now. Lee, I, I know we'd um, uh, we'd like to hear from you at um, where these have been implemented in your experience and, and the kind of things that um, you've, uh, what's resulted in your areas, what you're hearing from people, what you're seeing and different things like that from an engineering perspective. Um, okay, well, um, on your uh, Dragon Teeth slide, that was the city of Austin where we put the um, thermoplastics down. Um, it was, you know, Shauna's research to see what the impact was, and she asked for um, test places. I gave her, I think, I gave her a list of four, and that's the one she chose. And um, Austin's a small town, about 800 people. Uh, uh, the, the road this is on, it's County Road W42. It's got about 900 vehicles a day. It's a lot of commuters going north to Decorah. Um, it's very agricultural in the area. The community's got a big co-op in it. Um, so we have a very diverse amount of um, traffic that uses the roadway. And in this area, it is an expansion of the city um, in, as the residential um, homes are just being pushed north along the highway. And that's um, where we were starting to get a lot of issues and complaints. Vertically, the road's not the greatest. Uh, it's, um, it's, there's worse, but it's not the greatest. And um, so we were looking to come up with something to try to get people to slow down as they came into town. We'd taken uh, the, the speed signs and you know, we've hung the flags on them, trying to draw more attention to them. We uh, transitioned down from 55 to 45 to 25. Uh, the 45 was getting some effect. The 25 people were still, it's like they finally got to their 45 transition when they hit the 25. And so uh, when this was brought up, we thought, let's give this a whirl. And um, so we put it down. And the, the feedback's been spectacular. Uh, the people love it. Uh, it's from everything I've heard coming out of there, it, it's working. And um, it wasn't the people that are slightly over. It's, uh, it's as the slide shows there, it was the people that were really 10 miles an hour and more over the limit were the ones that it really made a big impact on their um, approach into the community. Uh, and so um, we're looking to expand this um, to a few other communities. And um, it spread like wildfire. So we're going to be doing more of these than I think we intended to. but. Um, 
we've done some other treatments around. We've tried the flash, uh, flashing beacons. Um, we have a couple uh, rural schools, and uh, we've put those up there, and we've had moderate success with them. They somewhat seem to become um, part of the landscape after they've been up for a while and uh, get ignored, but they um, did have some effect, and so we've kept those up. But um, far and away, this was the uh, uh, most successful thing we've done, and we're looking to do more of it. And Lee, those were thermoplastic, right? Correct. That's what those are. Yeah, they've been down since uh, 2011 or 12. Can't remember exactly which year. It got bumped back due to some issues with weather and things. But um, they've been down for a few years, and they're still they're starting to show a little bit of wear. But um, they've handled our carbides really well. A lot, a lot better than I thought they ever would. And um, yeah, they, the paint obviously. You know, we paint that road every year. Right. And, um, but these have held up really, really well. And I was just going to add, uh, this is a, a little bit of a variation of that, just without the dragon's teeth uh, in this slide. We painted a little bit wider edge line and it just did the squares. But uh, when we did these, uh, you know, the county sheriff who, who patrols a number of different towns came by and said, I'd like to add these to every, uh, every town that I patrol. So uh, law enforcement, you know, in that in that county was was very favorable to them and, and felt they had an impact as well. Uh, that was without, you know, we we didn't have numbers at the time showing that these actually do reduce those high end speeders. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, we've, you know, the since we put these down, um, we've got um, villages. They're not incorporated communities, but they're villages where, um, you know, it's just a cluster of a few homes and. You know, maybe a little uh, store or a bar or something like that, and um, and they want to see these go in because they've been um, they all talk about them. They've they've seen how they work, and uh, we've just really had a lot of great feedback with it. Well, that's wonderful to hear. They're very good. Okay, okay. We, we had a question uh, that was asking uh, your posted speed in town, and, and maybe this is for Lee actually. Yeah. Lee, your posted speed in town is 25 miles per hour. Is this important? If so, why? Uh, I've been trying to get 25 miles per hour posted in Minnesota for many years. Well, I mean, the 25 in a community like that is codified in Iowa, so I mean, we don't even technically have to post it, and that would be considered the speed. Um, the city of Austin sets their speed limit, and that's what they set it at. Um, and being that the issue of people slowing down was outside of the community. We're trying to get them slowed down before they get to that corporate limit was where that, and in that slide, you can see the sign sitting there. Um, right. The, um, we wanted to get them slowed down to that point. It is all residential and along there, and there is a school in the community, and, um, you know, it's, it's just something we thought we'd try, and it, it worked. Excellent. All right. Yeah. Do you, can you think of anything else that you can add? I know we're running out of time uh, here. Um, you know, we haven't we haven't spent a lot of time looking at it and seeing, you know, over time what it's done. We've basically relied on everybody that um, is in the area to give us feedback because they're more than happy to do that, and um, we're just we're going to have to probably redo this and add this in different places and um, I'm hoping we get the same results but um, the cost of it again we had this done as a research thing so our cost was minimal and um, from what we've seen come out of it um, my board has already said point blank that this is something we're going to do and um, we're working to get that done elsewhere. All right, that's what that's great. Um, I know we've got to, we might have another couple of questions here, but I'm, I think I'm going to um, answer those offline since we're um, almost out of time. So I want to thank everybody today for joining us for this third webinar, uh, webinar in the series. Um, we have another webinar on Tuesday, May 10th, for the presentation from Nicole Morris at the University of Minnesota and Kathleen Haney with the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, and and to learn more about their topic computerized crash reports, usability and design investigation, uh, join us on May 10th for that. 
Um, other than um, my email, I put up there for everybody. Um, if you want a continuing ed education, excuse me, certificate, um, or if you've got any questions that I can address offline, uh, I'll be happy to do so. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today.